start this afternoon session. In the next lecture, you'll be given by Dr. Hervé Cotin. So please, Hervé, take the floor. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. So I'm glad to be here again this afternoon. It looks like most of you were there yesterday. So we will somehow catch up and uh, and take the continuation of what we have explained yesterday. So yesterday I was more focused about well, the tool, the tools. So how we built a space mission to explore a comet. Now today it will be more about the science and the composition. But of course there are so many results. I will focus on some of them and those that are related to the organic composition. Not only organic, I will start to talk about a little bit about water. <coughs> but that's, I'm not going to talk about the origin of life, search of life. The link with astrobiology is the fact that this is the kind of organic material that has fallen on Earth and that has fallen on other planets of the solar system. So this somehow builds the list of ingredients, not the recipe of life, but part, maybe only part, part of the ingredients that contributed to the origin of life. And I will start with an, a short introduction that is an extract of a movie to promote the mission. So before the mission, how the outreach of ESA was built to tell us about why to go and what we want to learn about comets. So it's just a, sh a, short, uh, a short part of a, of a, of a movie. This is what we're looking at. 50% of the comet's going to be made of material like this. Possibly this water could have been delivered to the Earth by the comet. Can you hear? Is it loud enough? OK, so you, 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 what the guy you s you've just seen is Matt Taylor. Matt Taylor was a, a science manager of the, of the Rosetta mission. So a, a space project is a very higher hierarchical organization. For instance, I was a co i of one of the instruments. Above me was the PI, the principal investigator. The principal investigator was in charge of all the instruments. And so we, the co-eyes, were saying, were discussing, were saying we should do that, we should do that, we interpret this, we interpret that. And then we report, and we are discussing also with the, with the PI, and then the PIs of all the instruments were discussing about what should be the next step, the next move. And the final decision was in the end of Matt Taylor. So he was like the general in chief of all the, uh, of all the mission, but only for the science. So I have, I have to put it louder? It's so it, sh it might be OK. Is it OK? Okay. So let's start. This is what we're looking at. 50% of the comet's going to be made of material like this. Possibly this water could have been delivered to the Earth by the comets, whether it's like sheet ice or it's more dusty ice. This is why we're going to this comet, to see where that water comes from, to see is it connected to Earth at all. The reason we're at this comet is for science. No other reason. We're doing this to get the best science, to characterize this comet as has never been done before. OK, so he said the scene. So he's on the beach. I, I think it was in Norwich, near the ESA, one of the ESA centers in, in the Netherlands. And it, he's showing the water. And before the mission, and as I told you already yesterday, one of the big questions was, how the earth water is related to, to the comet. And the idea is, is that comets are made of half, roughly half, less. Now we think it's less than half, at least for this comet, half of water. So comets may have contributed to the origin of the ocean and bring other stuff, such as organics. And he says something that I really like, and I think it was really what we felt during this mission, is that the reason we had the comet, it was for science. Of course, we needed money and power <laughs> to decide to get, to, get there, to get there in the first place. But once we were at the comet, it was only pure science. 
So remember, I showed you that. The average has a function of, well, as a function of nothing. It, there's no really, there's not anything in the, um, in the x axis, but well, it's related to, to composition. And we had a nice story that was slowly developing over the last few years. Outlet comets had roughly twice the D over H ratio of, um, of the Earth water, and Jupiter family comets would have the same. So 67P is a Jupiter family comet, so you might think the result would be there. And it's been one of the first results that has been published. It was in December 2014, so the, first, the, the beginning of the measurement wa were in August 2014, and so this first paper was published a few, a few months after that. And yeah, everything is said in the title, a Jupiter family comet with a high D over H ratio. And high D over H ratio means five, roughly three times what we know on the Earth. So it's not only like the outload comet, but it's above what we've ever known for a comet. 67P is here. So it changed the ideas. <laughs> Do, did I say it co correctly? Ideas. <laughs> the ideas we had about comet composition, origin of water, but remember, we still have a limited number. It's still based on low statistics, and so th the, p the paper is quite um, is quite um, is quite is quite good. The result is quite good, but most of the outreach we've read at that time was, okay, the water on Earth cannot come from comets because we have this measurement and it's too high. But of course, some for it it's working for some comets, and I will tell you more about that. <coughs> so I said yesterday that there were still results that are published. This paper has been published this year. This is a kind of overview of the D-average ratio during the whole mission. Because when we learned that it was so high, one of our first thought was maybe it's a specificity of the beginning of the activity of a comet. Maybe it will change over the cruise, over the as a function of how far is the comet, how warm is the nucleus. I, we thought it might be something like that, but no. Excuse me, Eric, is this the water that's come out of the comet, or is this the water on the surface? No, it's, oh, uh, I didn't say that. I, it's, a, it's a good remark. This measurement has been made by mass spectrometry in the gaseous phase. So it's been made by Rosina, which is a mass spectrometer, and Rosina was collecting the gas phase, and it, it was able to derive this, um, this, uh, this ratio. So you can see five, 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 five. The average value is five, with, in the end, quite, quite low error bars. So it's quite hard to, to get data, and for 67P, the comet is not active enough to be probed from, uh, from ground. There are measurements from ground, but not for this comet. That would be interesting, of course. And I will elaborate about that, because sometimes it depends on the technique, too. <coughs> and in this paper, also, the same paper, you see that there are more comets that have been measured since uh, uh, the, first, uh, the first slide I, I showed you. And here you still have this classification of Jupiter family comets, or clouds comets, <coughs> and what you see is that 67P is the largest, still the largest, but we have more comets from um, the Kuiper belt that have been measured <coughs> Yesterday I was talking only about Hartley 2, but we s have now Virtanen, and Virtanen has somehow the within the error bars, and you have error bars here, it's important, within the error bars it has a terrestrial value. 
and Isn't what... Is the constructor value the green and the purple is the sun? <coughs> yes, the purple is the sun and terrestrial value is the green. I should have mentioned that. <coughs> and if you remember, yesterday I told you that the first target of the Rosetta mission was Comet Virtanen. It was meant to go to Comet Virtanen, but due to the problem with Ariane 5 launcher, it's been delayed, and then we move to Comet <coughs> 67P. So it means that if we went to Virtanen, the measurements we, made, we had made with Rosetta would probably, if there is no sensitivity to the measurement tool, would have been perfectly an Earth value. And then probably the conclusion would have been, oh, look, we understood everything. Jupiter family are terrestrial and the other are not. And <coughs> the picture gets more and more complicated because you see that since the two or three years we have new measurements like comet P1, which is a little bit above, and Lovejoy. And Lovejoy, you have two measurements. One, mes it's it was quite a, an active comet, so that's why it could be measured from, from the Earth. This measurement is a terrestrial measurement. It's been measured in the radio wavelength. And this one, which is above, has been measured in the infrared. And they, do they don't match. So there are something here that still needs to be understood. And well, I know the both teams working with those two techniques, and they are all extremely good, and they have a large experience of that, ca that kind of measurement, so. Uh, is, is there any theoretical expectation for the difference between or and Theoretically So, theoretically, the, f the, the idea first would have been that the process that led to the formation of quick purple co comets would have inherited of a chemistry that is similar than the chemistry of the synthesis of water on Earth. And Oort-Cloud comets would have been different. Or, yes, the Earth would have inherited of water from comets from the Kuiper belt. And what we see now is that over this limited number of measurements, yes, it's a mixture. You have in the Oort clouds, comets that have terrestrial value, you have in the Kuiper belts, comets that have terrestrial value. And well, people don't understand yet. There is one explanation, one correlation that has been shown recently. It's in this paper from 2019. <coughs> so it's the idea that the D over H ratio in comets vary is a function of the kind of activity that the comet is displaying. And their conclusion is that maybe it's very uh, uh, putative, it's, uh, it's not clearly demonstrated, but maybe all the comets have the same D over H ratio in the first time, at the beginning. And then, once they orbit, there is some kind of distillation uh, that is occurring. And they conclude that all comets may share the same Earth-like D over H ratio in water. And this is what is shown on this, uh, on this graph. This is a D over H ratio that has been taken from the list I've shown you uh, previously. This is, in blue, the Earth value. And here is what we call the active fraction of the comet. It's somehow related to estimation of how much active is the nucleus. If it's only 10% of the nucleus that's outgassing, if it's 100% of the nucleus that is outgassing, if it's more than 100%, what does it mean? If it's more than 100%, it means that there is, th there is there are also dust particles that are ejected from the nucleus, and those dust particles are still icy, and they are outgassing water. 
So the, the gaseous water is not released only from the nucleus, but from the nucleus plus IC particles that are ejected from the nucleus. And there are a little number of points, but you see that those who are not very active have much higher d over h ratios than those that are extremely active. So you have to be extremely careful about this interpretation, but I think it's interesting because at it's the first time we have a correlation, a correlation that can be related to some kind of physical process. But it, and also it can allow us to make predictions. So in the coming years, we will see if, if it's okay, if it's a good prediction or if it's false completely, and then we will have to think again about it. I'm discussing about that not just because I want to defend the comets and saying, yes, the water from the Earth comes from the comet. Here you have comet cometary samples. Uh, yes, I could have this tendency because I'm a cometary guy. And, well, I mean, in the end, I, I don't care. I don't care if it's comets or not comets, but just to attract your attention to the fact that you don't, you, tr you have to avoid to jump to conclusion if you don't have enough data. And I keep thinking about the what people would think if we had been to Virtanen, and probably people would talk about uh, water brought from comets. I'm a little confused by this because you're the comets, you're measuring what's coming off the comets, and if you increase the activity there, what's left behind be what would be contributed to the Earth, which would be just the opposite of what you're plotting here, right? Yeah, it depends if in the, at the origin of the solar system, how much comet fell and how pristine they were. So, so if, if Earth was, so let's, let's accept this idea that water comes from comet. So a few comets like that might be enough. No. It was coming off of what was left behind. Yeah. But what was left behind is is the opposite of what is plotted here. Because when you have more active, you're getting rid of the hydrogen. You're leaving more a higher DH behind. Right? So it'd be just the opposite of this curve. But maybe that's what you're talking about the light. Yes, but uh, it it depends how 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 old all comets formed at the early stage of the solar system, so I shouldn't say how old is a comet, but how many times she had to, to get from here to there. That's the idea. Uh, you, should, you should look at this view graph like that. So pristine comets sh are here, according to this paper, and comets that have circled around the sun, I don't know how many times, would be higher. So if you take a chunk of this one and you build the ocean from that. <coughs> and also don't forget, and I will leave this water question uh, there for the remaining of my, of my talk. Here are carbonaceous chondrites. Carbonaceous chondrites, ordinary chondrites, there is water in these objects. And yes, you, can, you could also explain the, uh, the formation of the ocean with those kind of material. There, are, there is less water, but the data match, matches. Okay, so liquid water, liquid water on the Earth is a key question in astrobiology. So that's why I started with, uh, with this question. Now I will move to the organic composition and I will briefly mention the phyllai results. Only briefly because there were not that many results because measurements have been allowed only for a few, a few days. And I want to focus on the instruments that contributed to measurement during more than two years rather than only two days. But we had a glimpse of the composition of the nucleus and it's what we call a serendipity measurement because when 
Philae bounced. When it bounced for the first time, it lifted dust particles. And it appears <coughs> from the measurements of the instrument that some dust got into the instrument. It was bouncing, flying a few meters above the surface of the nucleus. And there, were, there was an automatic sequence that was programmed. So Ptolemy and Kozak, the two GCMS, were running measurements, not in the GC mode, but in the direct MS mode, just to figure out where Philae would have landed and if there were already a gas that could be detected. So this is a, a mass spectrum. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of, um, of spectrum, but it shows an intensity as a function of a mass. To be rigorous, it's the mass divided by the charge of the fragment. And then you, it's somehow a scale where you weight your molecules. And sometimes your molecules are fragmented inside the instrument and then, you, and then you wait that part of a molecule, this other part of a molecule, and then you try to, to match the parts to build the molecule back uh, together. Here, it's what has been measured by, by Ptolemy. So a dust particle or a range of dust particles got inside the instrument and since Philae was warm enough, the some compounds have been outgassing from the dust. And at the same time, the mass spectrometer wa was measuring spectra. And this is what has been measured. So it says that, okay, look, look here, I here it's 91. There is a fragment on that, I that weight 91. And then you play with your periodic table to build a fragment that weight 91. And you have a fragment at 31 to at different masses, and then you try to, to reconstruct what the spectra is, uh, is made of. It's extremely complicated because, well, the basic idea first to have a GCMS, gas chromatograph. The gas chromatography is used to separate a mixture. So you put a bunch of molecules in the beginning of the column, the chromatographic column, and you push them through the columns, and it's like a race, but the race is driven by the electrostatic properties, the physicochemical properties of the molecules compared to what is inside the chromatographic columns. And so the mixture of molecules that are ejected at the same time uh, is released as a function of time and uh, as a function of the properties. And then you separate first, and you weight them after. There, everything is injected together. There is no sepa separation. So you see a bunch of things, and there is no way to have to an 100% certainty that you have the right interpretation. But at least they see that there is somehow a regularity in the pattern, a uh, difference of 31 that is repeated, and their interpretation is that this difference of 31 is made of CH2O, and this would be the kind of mass spectra you get if you have polyoxymethylene. Polyoxymethylene is a formaldehyde polymer, so that's why it's a polymer. You have the repetition of CH2O, CH2O, CH2O. And polyoxymethylene is a molecule we've talked about since Halle in Comet, because there were already at that time one mass spectru spectrum that was interpreted, interpreted by the presence of polyoxymethylene. And there are also some st strange, well, some behavior of the atmosphere evolution, composition e evolution of some in some comets that is interpreted by the presence of polyoxymethylene. So it was not that much of a surprise to see that kind of pattern, but it could be interpreted by other um, combination of molecules. This is what so COSAC. COSAC is a second mass spectrometer. This is what was measured 
while Philae was bouncing. And on this view graph, you see a spectrum that was measured before Philae landed, when it was uh, um, still uh, connected to the spacecraft. And this is one of the spectrum that was measured before Philae was turned off due to the lack of energy. So you see, th this is the background of the instrument. So you see that there is something, definitely there is something that is, uh, that is detected. So masses are ranges from one to one, on from zero to 100. What, what's the background of that? Well, it's the background of the instrument. It's the, the case of kind of residual gases you, you, you have in, in the instrument and some fragmentation. Sometimes you have uh, some uh, electronic parts that are outgassing, and so you have to take that. Can you tell by where the dust peaks are? Where yes, yes. But here, again, it's a mixture. And you have to figure out what is the mixture made of. And you cannot just say, OK, let's take this mass. It's, uh, I'm not sure it's 44, so let's figure out what is 44. And, say, and then you conclude, oh, it could be CO2. But yes, but you can have other molecules that would have fragments and some of the fragments might add so beef at 44. So it's not one peak, one molecule. Each peak can be linked to one molecule or the uh, fragmentation of another. <coughs> and the people, are, well, they have only one spectra. So they had to deal with that. I mean, you have to publish something. It's the only data you have, and you know the only data you will have. So you have to, <coughs> to think the, be the best interpretation. And this is a list of molecules they have proposed. And what is interesting, and the st that the story which was behind this, uh, this publication, is that this list of molecules can be produced by the photochemistry of ICs made of water, mono carbon monoxide, methane, and ammonia. If you do that in the laboratory, I will get into much more details about that kind of chemistry tomorrow, because today I'm telling you what we see. Yesterday I told you how <laughs> we've been able to see it. And to tomorrow I will tell you why it's there, and the chemistry behind that. And if you run in a laboratory an experiment where you froze these kind of materials and you irradiate them either by <coughs> protons or by uh, UV photons, then you will induce a chemistry that would lead to this kind of complexity. So this diversity of compounds, the interpretation is that it might be the result of that kind of chemistry in ICs that are exposed to radiation. And that's a story in cometary, um, <coughs> in the cometary science that is not new, and a lot of astrochemists as are working about this kind of, uh, of chemistry. So that could be a signature of organic chemistry in the ice phase, and it could be related either to chemistry that occur in, in interstellar clouds, so before the formation of the solar system, or in the protostellar proto nebula. But, but I'm, I'm confused. Go back one slide. <coughs> it just seems like it's all contamination. But look how correlated the non-signal is to what you're calling a signal. It's really highly correlated. So the, the green and the red are highly correlated. There are peaks of green precisely where there are peaks of red. Yes, but isn't that, isn't that worrisome? <laughs> th th there are peaks that are really clear detection. I, um, <coughs> oh, because for instance, at 42, it's CO2. So CO2 would be in the background. It would be, and it could be also in the comet. It is uh, at, at the comet. <coughs> so people are arguing since then about the interpretations. There have been other papers proposing other interpretations, and one of the most recent papers has been published a few months ago, so in 2022. And so this they go back and they interpret this time the mass, um, uh, the mass spectra with 12 molecules, 
and you see the, the white peaks here are peaks that are not accounted by this interpretation. So just to tell you about the kind of methodology that is adopted to, to interpret those, um, <coughs> those data and that there is no univocal interpretation of these, um, of these data and that people are still working. And uh, I mean, it's not that complicated if you want to, to play with that kind of interpretation, you, you can do that. You, you have database of fragmentation of molecules and you can try to match the, um, the, um, the mass spectrum that has been measured. <coughs> so it's not a surprise to see so many molecules because from the ground in the atmosphere, we see that there are molecules in the gaseous phase. The point of going to Rosetta is to try to know what is on the nucleus. Is what we see in the atmosphere exactly what is on the nucleus or is, 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 is there more molecule? Are there more molecules on the nucleus uh, or not? And actually, yes, there are more molecules that we can see going at the comet. And this is an infography of not all, some of the molecules that have been detected. So you can clearly see that it's not been drawn by a chemist <coughs> because the molecules are not uh, grouped by chemical families, but they are grouped whether they are long chains, heavy chains, they are volatile, they are they are smelly, they are po poisonous, but well, it's for outreach. It just show and illustrate the diversity of compounds that have been detected by, uh, by uh, this instrument, uh, the mass spectrometer measuring compounds in the, ga in the gaseous phase. And you see, and, and it was done on purpose, that you could see some tails, some ears over there, and at that time we knew that there were more. <coughs> and there is more. And here at the center, you have the king of the zoo, it's glycine. So why is it there it's at the center and <coughs> shown as the king of the zoo? Because it's an amino acid. And well, the outreach message was to say, look, there's glycine. So glycine, we think it's important for life as we know it. So maybe, yes, the first amino acids could have been brought by, by comets. So that's why it's in the center. And the paper was called Prebiotic Chemicals, Amino Acids and also Phosphorus was detected <coughs> at that time. And here you see this peak is associated to glycine. This peak and other fragments that have been detected in the spectra. Well, there's much more to life than detecting glycine, but it was something well, interesting enough to be pushed forward and to be proposed to the media, and there's been a lot of outreach about this detection. <coughs> but de dev devil is in the details. And here you see the density of glycine as a function of the distance from the nucleus. So if all the glycine is, it's not, it's density multiplied by R squared. So if the density, if the glycine is produced only from the nucleus, and then it would be uh, diluted around the nucleus following a spherical symmetry, to that spherical dilution you would add some photochemistry. But if you only, only follow the <coughs> uh, outgassing from the nucleus and dilution, you would expect to have an horizontal line. And actually the stars here are showing the behavior of the global atmosphere of the comet. The density is actually beha uh, behaving as expected. But the glycine is not behaving as expected. Its density per R square is rising, is increasing as a function of the distance. And that's something puzzling. And we have proposed an interpretation for this, um, for this behavior. So here, you can see it's the same, the same points than you've seen previously. <coughs> and we propose that glycine is not only released from the nucleus, but is 
might be also produced in the atmosphere. So this is a nucleus, this is glycine, and then you can have some glycine that is ejected in the gaseous phase that, has, that can be photolyzed and give some photoproducts. But the only way we found so far to match the observation is that you have icy dust particles and within the ice you have glycine. And if you are modeling the sublimation of the ice as a function of the distance, and within this ice, you will, when this ice is outgassing, is sublimating, you release glycine, then you can match the data. It's not a perfect match, but it's the best we can do so far to interpret this observation. And it can also give you a rough estimation of how much glycine is present in the, in the, um, in the ice. So it's roughly 2, 10 to the minus 5 percent in mass in the nucleus. In the ice, sorry, not in the total mass. It was not the first time glycine was claimed to have been detected in comets. <coughs> Actually, back in 2009, when the stardust samples were written after the stardust samples were returned to Earth, they've been analyzed. Yesterday I told you that for the organic part it's been extremely difficult because you have some weird and something that you cannot reproduce in the laboratory, high velocity chemistry between the organic contamination of the aerogel collecting the dust particles and the dust particles from the comet. But <coughs> in this paper, there is a detection of glycine and also another amino acid called alanine. Uh, and we are pretty confident that it's not due to a contamination because of some isotopic um, measurements that, that are showing that the, isot the carbon isotopic composition in the glycine and alanine that have been detected are not compatible with the uh, isotopic composition of carbon in the uh, contamination. But still one question was remaining, because to make these measurements, you had to put the dust particles in solution, in, an, in a solvent, and then you still have the possibility to induce organic synthesis, and so it we may not conclude from those stardust results that glycine is actually at the comet, but at least that there are precursors of glycine at the comet. And once you put them in a solvent, here they use liquid water at some point, once you put, you put them in a solvent, those precursors would lead to the formation of glycine. So for stardust, we knew that there were at least glycine precursors. With Rosetta, we know that there is glycine. And Tomorrow, I will explain you why it is not that surprising to have glycine, and especially in the ice of the comet. So we have very nice um, outreach view graphs, as I showed you, but well, we have rough data and we have variation of the molecular composition of the atmosphere during the whole period of the, of the mission. We have estimation of the abundance of the, of the molecules. I don't know if you see it easily, but usually when, we will, when you count how much molecules are present in the atmosphere of a comet, you always normalize to water. Water is the most abundant compound in the atmosphere of the comet, at least when it's sufficiently uh, close to the, to the sun. So water is 100, and you can see that CO2 is around 5%, CO3%, O2, 3% too. It's a big surprise to find so much O2 in, uh, in the atmosphere of the comet. Some hydrocarbons, a fraction of, um, of percent. You will find formaldehyde, you will find formic acid, you will find ammonia, you will find HCN. <coughs> and actually, you if you are very naive, uh, you can beat life from 
those constituents because from <coughs> formaldehyde, ammonia, HCN, you can do what we call the Strecker synthesis and you can synthesize amino acids with just those three molecules. You can synthesize uh, sugars with formaldehyde too. So, well, from that you have basic ingredients that can be extremely useful to build all the prebiotic material we think are important to the origin of life, at least as we know it. <coughs> but all this diversity, so CO2, CO are not organic compounds, but from here it's organic, so methane and the other molecule based on carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, their abundance is extremely low. And for the glycine, I've just mentioned, our conclusion is that it's only 200 ppb per part per billion in the water hive. So there's a large diversity, but a relatively low abundance. There have been also some results that were unexpected. Remember yesterday, I told you that at the end of the mission, we wanted to go very near the nucleus. We were taking risk. And it was not um, ineffective, because actually, during the last few orbits around the comet, when we were very near, some dust particles entered inside the instrument that is meant to measure the gas. So it could be a disaster, because the instrument is not built to get solid stuff inside. So if it occurs at the end of the mission, well, too bad. You had very interesting stuff before, and you kill your instrument. But we've been lucky, because indeed, some solid stuff get inside, stayed just at the beginning, and then it's been warmed. And since the instrument was making spectra, it's been able to measure the ice sublimating and sublimating right in front of the nose of the instrument. So it allowed to get to a sensitivity it was not able to reach before. And it led to the detection of a new class of compounds that were not detected before, that are compounds that we call, I don't like that term, but everybody uh, uses it, semi-volatile. For me, it doesn't mean anything, because either it's refractory or it's volatile, it's not semi-volatile. But the idea conveyed by the word semi-volatile is it's not that it's not as volatile as most of the volatile, but it's slowly outgassing. <coughs> and it shows that there are some ammonium salts, like ammonium chloride, ammonium cyanide, ammonium cyanate, ammonium formate, ammonium acetate, and they've been detected thanks to this unexpected event. I'm not saying it changed the old story about prebiotic chemistry, but when you look at the literature, the people who are working in their laboratory and they are running experiments, I said, for instance, that if you, you can do the um, um, Strecker synthesis with uh, HCN, ammonium, and um, and formaldehyde, but the chemist in his laboratory, he won't take HCN. He will, he, he will take, uh, he will take, for example, ammonium cyanide. And then you get two parts of what is needed to make the, st the Strecker synthesis. So it's a kind of organics of the shelf you use in the laboratory to make prebiotic chemistry, uh, to conducted prebiotic chemistry in the laboratory. It's, it's there, it's at the comet whether it's been used or not, how much of it is there, it's still uh, debated. We don't know for certain, but it's, um, it's, it's there. <coughs> and also another recent paper that had been published uh, early this year. So you see that there's still data that are processed and, and a lot of interesting results that get some kind of identification of a new ensemble of cometary organic molecules because what was detected easily was 
molecules up to 60, 70 um, mass, uh, mass units, but with the integration of many and many spectra, um, um, the authors have been able to get to much more, uh, to higher, higher masses, more than 120, and, and they give an estimation of the rough composition of this material, so it's it's tiny, but it's it's a gross composition, so it's not a formula. It's C1 H 1.5 O 0.1 N 0.04 S 0.02, and this kind of gross composition is close to the gross composition of what we find in uh, organic, in uh, carbonaceous chondrites for the soluble matter. In the carbonaceous chondrite, you have two parts for the organic, the soluble matter and the insoluble matter. I will talk about insoluble matter later, but for the soluble matter, uh, this kind of composition looks like the same. So there might be some link between the organic composition of comets and the organic composition of the carbonaceous chondrites. So I talked about the gaseous phase. Now let's talk about the solid phase. So COSIMA was the instrument uh, into which I've been uh, mostly uh, involved, and it was, I, I have nothing to do about the, its uh, construction, so I was in high school <laughs> when it was uh, uh, elaborated and built, so I can say without saying, sending flower to myself, I can say that it's a marvel. It's a, it's a toolbox. First, you have a series of targets. Targets are small squares of one centimeter in size, that are made of various materials, uh, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, and they are here in a target store. And then you have a mechanical tool that will grab a series of trees, they are al always coming by tree, and take them to an aperture, and this aperture is exposed to the nucleus and the cometary environment. From time to time, we take a picture. We look if we have something. If we have nothing, we go back there. We wait. We take a picture. And it's a picture that is made by a microscope. And we see if there is something. And if we have something, we go there. And this is what we call a time of flight mass spectrometer with ionization surface ionization, what we call secondary ion mass spectrometry. So you have here an ion gun. The ion gun, well, you will aim to what you got, the, par the particle, and you will send, it was indium ions, you will send your ions at the surface of the dust particles, and with the energy, it will somehow destroy and degrade the surface, and eject what we call the secondary ions, and those secondary ions get into what we call the time of flight mass spectrometer. So they will have a certain dis distance to get through, and they are into an electrostatic, electrostatic field, and so the lighter, the faster. And you have uh, a timer, and then you measure how long it takes to the ion to get from here to there. And so you got your their mass. <coughs> so this is one picture. This picture was taken on May 11th, 2015. So imagine it's only one centimeter. We took that picture. We put the, the target holder at the aperture. And we got back the day after. This is cometary stuff. At the beginning of the mission, we were anxious to get something. 
and if we got something to be able to see it, because it could have been so small that we would not be able to see it. All this stuff is cometary nucleus part that have been expelled by the gas when it's hot gassing, so it's tiny parts of comets inside of the, uh, of the instrument. <coughs> and what is interesting is that it's collected at re relatively low velocity. <coughs> Stardust collection were roughly at six kilometers per second. At Halley, the relative velocity between the spacecraft and the dust particles from the comet was roughly 60 kilometers per second. So if you catch something, you destroy it and you transform it, then 10 kilometers per second, I don't know if someone is running at 10 kilometers per, per second, but it's uh, roughly the world record of, uh, <coughs> of, of sprint. But if you run at that velocity, if you take a wall, yes, it hurts, but your molecular composition won't change. And it's the same. Their shape, a little bit, but not much, and the molecular composition will remain. <coughs> so we had a lot of them. And when we were discussing, we decided in the end to give them first name. And the, the, t the two first that became famous for us are Kinev and Juliet, because these are the first dust particles on which we finally understood what was happening and what we saw. Here you have a map of the carbon. So each uh, round is a measurement. So we were not doing measurement at only one point. We were scanning, we were me doing measurement on the target to have the background, and we are running measurements on the dust particle. Lines, cross, matrices, always having in mind the fact that we want to tell what is from the comet and what is from the instrument especially for organic materials. You cannot take an instrument in space without any organic material. It's a mess. And you want to be sure that you see and analyze the comet and not your contamination. <coughs> and here you see that it's relative to what is on the target holder. We see the carbon. <coughs> and this is the mass spectra. Actually, before, we were getting prepared to analyze the spectra with the idea that it would be extremely complicated. There would be hundreds of peaks because it would be a nightmare, a mixture of many organic molecules, and you would see peaks everywhere. So we got prepared for that. We, I started in 20, 2004 to build a calibration library with many organics, many organics, much more than those are that appear here. Organics that have names, that have chemical structure, and you see the kind of pattern you get in the mass spectra if you analyze this molecule, which is called exatriacontane, or here, cytosine. So if you have a mixture of all those molecules, you have all those peaks mixed together. That's not what we see. Red are measurements on the dust particle, black are measurements of the background of the instrument. <coughs> so here you see, okay, we see iron. So iron is not that exciting if you are doing uh, organic chemistry, but at least it's a good indicator that it's not contamination. You are really on the dust, on the dust particle because there is no iron at all in the background. So that's a good sign we are really where we want and we want, and we are analyzing what we what we want to analyze. We see silicon, we see sodium, we see magnesium, we see uh, uh, other mineral uh, uh, elements, but not much carbon. And the few fragments that that is associated to organic compounds are only those small ones: C plus, CH plus, CH two plus, CH three plus. So that was quite disturbing because that's not something we were expecting. That's not that. <coughs> we were also running simulations, the kind of simulations that mixed interstellar ICs, irradiate them. We can do that in the laboratory. And this is a kind of 
compounds, fragmentation you have. So a lot of peaks, that's not what we see. The best match we found is when we analyze insoluble organic matter. It's not the same, it's important, it's not the same, but it's the best match. When you take insoluble organic matter that is extracted from carbonaceous chondrites and you put it on our ground instrument, it's important we have to use exactly the same instrument as the one which is in space. We have the exact replica in a laboratory in Germany because otherwise, if you take a random mass spectrometer, you won't have the same kind of ion, you won't have the same kind of energy, so you won't have the same kind of fragmentation. So we use exactly the same. And it's the best match. And it leads us to get to the conclusion that what is on the dust particles is related to insoluble organic matter. So this is one kind of view you will find in the literature. So it's not a molecule that, is, that has a name. It's not a molecule that you can draw according to the fundamental rule of nomenclature of organic chemistry. It doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have a end. It's kind of complex network. And I like very much this kind of representation. So this is kerogen. So kerogen is a terrestrial material somehow linked in, in, in the term of structure to insoluble organic matter. And it gives you a better view. It's not plan. It's a three-dimensional network. And when we analyze with COSIMA, our instrument, that kind of material, the signature, the fingerprint that we get in the mass spectra match what we get at the comet. So this, well, we cannot bring the comet back. So we have to rely on this calibration. R, R, R is radical, it means anything. In chemistry, when you put R, it means anything, anything organic. <coughs> so, how much? Because, okay, we've had an animal, but we want to know if it's that or that. So, then you have to run on calibration for what it is, and we have to run other kind of calibration to, yes, to have an idea of how much there is. <coughs> and this is what we get. So first, here you have a series of roughly 20 dust particles. You can find Juliette, Kinef is here. You can see that they are not all the same. This is carbon over silicon ratio as a function of uh, the dust particle. This is the shape of the particle, shatter cluster, rubble pie, glued cluster, compact particle. Well, it's not correlated to the shape of the particle. And you see that there is a, some a continuum in composition between ratio of two up to a ratio of eight. And the average ratio is 5.5. .5. And here is how it compares to carbonaceous, Chondrite, CI chondrite, like orgoy meteorite. So orgoy meteorite is here. This is 67P. This is the sun. So there is much more carbon in the dust particles of comet 67P that we find in the meteorites. It's related somehow, probably in terms of composition, but there is roughly a factor of 10 more carbon in the comet in this comet than in carbonaceous chondrites. So, yes, we try our best to characterize. So we compare the amount of nitrogen. So we see that in our cometary particles, the nitrogen amount, nitrogen over carbon ratio is roughly the same than in insoluble organic matter from chondrites. The H over C, that's interesting, there is more H over C. The red and blue is the comp are the composition of the dust particles. So red is because we have two sets of analysis, one in the positive mode, another one in the negative mode. So we have the same conclusion in the positive and in the negative, so that's a relief. And it's slightly more 
it's significant. We have more hydrogen in um, in these um, in this cometary material than in um, meteorites, and this is d over h. d over h ratio in insoluble organic matter is here. In water on Earth is here. In 67p, it's a gray line, and this is what we have in our organic material. So this high value of d over h ratio in this organic um, matter is interpreted by the fact that it is as probably, with some uncertainties, an inheritance from the solar molecular cloud. Because roughly speaking, high d over h ratio is related to an interstellar composition and low the over H ratio is more related to a protosolar composition. It's linked to the kinetics and the thermodynamics of the chemistry in both, in both media. And if you compare here D over H as a function of H over C, you can see the blue points are the cometary dust particles. Those stars, squares, round, and uh, triangles are measurements in meteorites, and you see that meteorites are, are here, 67p particles are there, and it shows that it's less processed. If you take this kind of material, and if you irradiate here, or if you warm it, cook it, it will lose more easily deuterium than hydrogen, it will lose more easily hydrogen than carbon, and this material will go down like that. So we have more carbon and a carbon that is probably more pristine in the history of the solar uh, system than what is found in meteorites. Okay, so this is what we have now. We are still working on those data. So how much time do I have? We <laughs> Sorry? Three minutes. Three minutes, but, but I started late. <laughs> okay, so some disclaimers. Those particle composition are measured by COSIMA in the what is it's ejected, and so we have to make an assumption of what is ejected is representative of what is on the nucleus. It's reasonable, but we cannot demonstrate for sure that there is no selection in what is ejected compared to what is in the nucleus. And this is what we have in terms of composition. So this is the atom, the composition in number, the composition in mass. So roughly speaking, one third of carbon, one third of oxygen, one third of hydrogen. I'm talking about the refractory part, the solid component that has been collected in Cosima. I'm not talking about the ice, the gaseous samples. They are gone when we run our, our analysis. So the composition in mass, and with some, well, let's say, educated assumption, we can try to put what is in mineral, the elements that are related to mineral and the elements that are related to organic together, and we get to roughly half mineral and half organic. And in volume, it's also based on assumption, but I think it's interesting because when you see the tiny stuff stuck on the, on, on the target holder, you could you would say, okay, it's patchy, dusty, but you don't know what it is. But what you see probably in volume is roughly 70% of organic and only 30% of mineral. So there are a lot of carbon in composition, in or of organic material in abundance and in volume. So now we try to connect the dust, the dots. We have all those volatiles that are detected in the gaseous phase, those macromolecules in the refractory phase. Are they linked together? Is there something that gets from here to there or there to here? And you add the salt, of course, that have been detected. So we detect a lot of volatile by, Ros by Rosina in the gaseous compounds. From what we've seen, this glimpse we've had with Kozak and Ptolemy on Philae, we think that, yes, some kind of 
chemistry can occur between those dominant material in the icy phase that would get to more complexity. Photochemistry, radiolysis can do the trick. But then, if you carry on the processing of this ice mixture, you would get to the kind of diversity of larger molecules you would expect to see in the solid phase that are in our library, but we don't see at the comet. And if you, and, and if we do, and, you, and if we carry on this experiment, adding more UV, more radiation or heat, then we get to something that looks like insoluble organic matter. I tend to call it high molecular weight compounds because, well, we don't know if it's IOM, and you, you can say it's insoluble as long as, long as you don't put it in, in a solvent. So I use the word high molecular weight compounds. Well, so there is no equivalent of that. Maybe something in the gaseous phase that tends to that, but nothing in the solid phase. So where are they? Two possibilities. Below the detection limit of the instrument, that's a possibility, or they are not there. And if they are not there, it means that there might be two sources for those organics. The kind of heavily processed, high molecular weight materials that result of a long history in ice phase, for instance, with a lot of radiations. And on the other hand, what you see in the gaseous phase, that is something that has been frozen afterwards and add some energy, some photochemistry, some chemistry, but did not get that far into the complexity. So I can skip this one. This is a very gross overview based on what I've just said of how the nucleus is made of. Because that time, I add the volatile part. So it's not that far from what we are expecting. One third mineral, one third organic, one third volatile. But in this volatile part, you have water, which is dominated, CO, CO2, and all the diversity that, was, that is often put forward to say, oh, there's a lot of organics. Yes, there's a lot of organics in diversity, but those small, reactive, fancy, and uh, fancy and yes, prebiotic, with quotes and quotes <laughs> and quotes, prebiotic molecules, they are a rather low level. Most of the carbon that is brought from comets like 67P come in this form of high molecular weight. And you have some molecules that are disturbing, distributed like glycine that is in water and salt. OK. <laughs> Fi almost final before my conclusion. All comets are not necessarily born equal in composition. So it might look not democratic, but that's a fact. They have the same rights to be studied. <laughs> Same interest for us, but they are not necessarily equal. F for instance, when in the Stardust results, in some I've not I've never worked on those uh, on those samples, but if you read the papers, there are very small, uh, uh, very limited num number of papers about organics, not nec on not only due to the contamination, but also some in some papers you see that maybe this comet is poor in organics or they don't say the comet is poor in organics, they write that the spacecraft sampled uh, dust that are poor in organics. They don't dare to say the comet in its whole is, is poor in organics. But in all our dust particles, we have roughly the same kind of rich composition of dust uh, in, in organics. So conclusion, so the comet, like 67P, are an important reservoir of carbon and organic matter in the solar system, much more than in uh, meteorites. This 
refractory phase I've um, talked about is dominated by high molecular weight component. And most of the carbon in the comet is, is stored in this complex form. So if you think about astrobiology, well, either you say, okay, we have enough to play with for prebiotic chemistry with all those molecules that are in small amounts, but it's enough. You put a comet into the ocean and you have enough material to play and induce the prebiotic chemistry. But most of the carbon is in this form. And I think we have to think now about that if it's relevant, if somehow it can play some kind of role. And yes, we've not done yet, and maybe there's still something mi missing in the pictures, and we have still a lot of data to, to process. Thank you. So thank you, Evie, for the nice lecture. So questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, where do comets go to die? And this IOM, for example, you said that the IOM looks like it's the uh, same, could be the source of IOM and chondrites. Could the source of chondrites be cometary nuclei? It, the abundance doesn't match, so that's for sure. There are much more here than in carbonaceous chondrites, but you cannot exclude the idea that you get this pristine material and this pristine material when it gets the parent bodies of the um, carbonous chondrites, it gets submitted to a lot of further processes. You have hydrothermalism, you have, uh, you have liquid water in, in the parent bodies of carbonous chondrites. Some have been heated and so it makes sense, I cannot prove it, but at least it's consistent to think that if you start with this kind of material, and if you put it at high temperature, you will lose most of the carbon at the whole, and what, is, what would be remaining would be depleted in hydrogen in deuterium. So it makes sense. But in the community of people working on insoluble organic matter, they are still fighting, well discussing, making science actually. It's not necessarily bad to fight in science, but people are still trying to figure out where it comes from. And if the soluble fraction is coming from the insoluble fraction, it's the hydrothermalism, for instance, of the insoluble fractions that um, freeze the soluble fraction, or if the insoluble fraction is a result of the processing of some more simple material and the soluble part is what remains and that has not been processed and put into this insoluble matter. Um, the reason I ask this question is because when you study the asteroids, like from 2AU, 3AU, 3.5, they, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, they said, oh, here is a comet-like asteroid at 3 or 3.5 AU. Now, is that, I mean, if you go a little bit further, does that become more like a comet? And could, I'm just wondering about this intersection between the word comet and comet-like asteroid and asteroid. Yeah. So is, we put it in two boxes, asteroids, comets. But you can think, easily think about uh, comets going round and round and round and then ge getting completely depleted into volatile. And then it would look like an asteroid. So there's probably in the <laughs> asteroid belt an uh, ex instant comet. What I think is that in our collection of carbonaceous chondrites, we Probably, if I'm, if I'm based on the composition, we probably don't have a carbonous chondrite that is a fragment of a comet, like this one. That's for sure. On the other hand, in micrometeorites, I will talk a little bit about that uh, tomorrow, but there are some micrometeorites that are called ultra-carbonaceous micrometeorites, and they are found in Antarctica. 
and and some of them sh have very high content in organic material. And it's fantastic because you can study them in the laboratory. You don't have to rely on measurements on an old instrument that was built uh, 30 years ago. So you can do the science in uh, at, at its, its full extent uh, of our capacity right now. But um, there are still things that are not matching between those some of those micrometeorites and what we see at, at the comet. So we have very s a small number of data. We should go to, to make 10 Rosetta missions and go to 10 different comets, and I'm pretty sure we will find a diversity. And uh, we put it into this or single box comet, but it's uh, more complex. Thank you. Thank you. How many detections of glycine have we had in comets? Uh, in two comets. Dilt? Uh, in VIL2, but and with this question whether or not it's uh, in the comet or the result of the analysis, and here. That's it. Yes, it's extremely low. You, ma you, made the, you make the headline you publish in, <laughs> in Nature or Science when you detect it, but it's extremely low. So you cannot, no, I think you, we, you cannot imagine detecting it from, uh, from Earth. Is it lower than in the carbonaceous chondrite detections? Of oh, <laughs> um, in, uh, when we publish, I, I remove that slide, uh, it, it matches some families of carbonaceous chondrites. Actually, in the carbonaceous chondrites, you have those that have been more heated than others, and more that and some that have sub been submitted to more hydrothermal hydrothermalism than others. And you have those that are in between, not the Goldilocks, <laughs> the Goldilocks meteorites. And um, we are roughly at the level of the in-betweens. But we see only glycine. And in the meteorites, you see a whole series of, uh, of uh, other amino acids. And what is might be disturbing, at least it, it has some questions, is that alanine, in most of the meteorites, it's another amino acid, is, de is detected at the same level than glycine. But and we don't see it. We looked for alanine, and we don't see it. But those 80 other amino acids that were in Murchison, mm -hmm. could they be in these comets, and you just haven't detected them? It's. Maybe it's below the detection limit. My feeling is that it's not there. Because uh, what, we, what I will show you uh, tomorrow is that in the ice phase, you can synthesize glycine. Don't be worried too much. I won't get into too sophisticated uh, chemi chemistry. But in three steps, you get glycine. And in the laboratory, no one ever has ever been able yet to synthesize other amino acids without liquid water. I don't say it's not there. But for me, it makes sense not to see it. And I believe, my feeling, uh, educated feeling, is that it's not there. Because no liquid water. But it'll be there once they get rid of the volatiles and it gets heated up and then they have aqueous alteration, then they'll become. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Mm. Okay. Is alanine the next simplest amino acid? Yeah. And if, if it you were there, would Rosetta detect it? Was it detectable? Yes, in most of the carbonaceous chondroits, its abundance is the same than glycine. Yeah. So glycine, we don't see it every time. We see mostly it when it's as we the spacecraft was near a, a dust event, a dusty in a dusty coma. Um, so we would have seen alanine if it was at the same level of glycine, like in the carbonaceous uh, chondrites. So your guess is it's not there? Or? Extremely low concentration. Yeah. OK. OK, another question? No. I have one. OK. So 
you show that atomic uh, ratios, for example, the deuterium over hydrogen and carbon over si silicon, it seems for me that all the time for 67P, the, the ratio is higher compared to the other comets, like Halley and Hale-Bob. Is that right? Mm. So you're probably talking about this one, this slide. Yeah. Error bars. Okay. okay. So I don't okay. say that. Yeah. And, okay. and actually, so here we have a series of... Um, of 20 particles. Now we have a series of 60, mm -hmm. and the average is lower. We are still consistent with our error bars, but then here, yes, you can dream, oh, it's better, it's better than Ale <laughs> because there's more carbon, but mm -hmm. no, no, we are okay, probably I roughly the it. same. Okay. Thank you. So another question? No? So let's thank you again. Thank you.